Hello there. Welcome to the Saraway channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing remarkably well, and I hope things are going very well for you. And we're really getting a lot colder wherever we are around the world. Some of us might be getting hotter, depending on where you're located. But I hope you're keeping yourself lovely and warm, and drinking those lovely warm cups of cocoa, because I've got a fabulous story for you tonight, and this is part two of our story. So if you haven't heard part one, please click on the description because you don't want to miss out on the whole story. So let's get started. My dear Josie, listen to yourself. You're not thinking rationally, are you? You're thinking more like a child, not like a woman. You need to be terribly practical. You're making a decision that is going to ultimately affect your entire life. We've known Tobias for many long years, me and your father. And we know him to be a principal man of sound character. I think you would be a dreadful fool to refuse his proposal. Next time you might not be so lucky. For righteous, incorruptible men like Tobias don't grow on trees. I'm not comfortable to set you up with a stranger for marriage, and neither is your father. If I know not about his character, look at your sister and her unscrupulous husband's great affection for the cider that stole her thunder. Your poor sister was incredibly lonely living with him, but at least after his tragic passing she has some relief. She's been left well provided for. You don't want to go down the same precarious path as her, do you, dear? If you remember, she was quite taken by the yellow-bellied Mr. Roxburgh in the very beginning. Thought her heart had been struck down with an impassioned great love. But instead the unethical Mr. Roxburgh was a dreadful disappointment to her. And her knight in shining armour he most certainly was not. Too many women out there whimsically dream of a prince charming. But what you see is not what you always get. Many of my friends have shared this sobering truth with me over the years when discussing their own personal relationships. Tobias has known you for years, since you were a little girl, Josie. He has developed a great affection for you, has always found you pleasing on the eye. You remind him very much of his beloved late wife, whom he treated like the perfect princess. He is the quintessential gentleman, dear, and I am in no doubt he will make you terribly happy. And who knows, in time, you may grow fond of him. I'll never fall in love with Tobias, mother, never, said Josie indignantly. Nothing about him beguiles my fancy. He's far too old for me besides. I like Mr. Hugh Maynard. He's the kind of man that I could grow to love. He's only a year older than me. He's a man of sizable means and would meet my favour well. Furthermore, when I lay eyes on him, he makes my heart a flutter with those green eyes and curly dark curls of his. He has on him the appearance of an angel, and dimples besides. Josie, he's a very agreeable man, I will agree. But he has shown you no interest. All the women he has the eye for have red hair, do they not? I am told he has the eye for women with red hair and blue eyes. I doubt greatly that you are his type, without wishing to cause you offence. Josie wasn't happy about marrying Tobias, but she knew her parents were right, that Hugh Maynard would never give her a second glance. Word around town was he was in love with Eloise Duncan Gray, and that woman with her long red hair had made men's knees crumble. Eloise's stunning beauty invited competition that she knew she could not defeat. How she wished she could own hair like that, locks of woven gold. She didn't even find Tobias attractive, but she firmly decided that her mother was right, that the safe option was so much better than a risky one. She had seen how her sister's love affair with the debonair, chivalrous Mr. Roxburgh had seemingly curdled from sweet honeyed milk, which invited the potential of so much promise to sour curdled congenial cream that had turned rancid. 
so even the allure of a blemish-free love could offer her no guarantees. Nothing was written in stone, and relationships born from love were not necessarily more successful than ones entered into with a more business-like approach or formal arrangement, shall we say. She knew with certainty that Tobias would treat her terribly well, but she doubted she'd ever fall in love with the man, for he was incredibly old. She had to consider her future, and Tobias would provide for her well. Of course, when she arrived here at Foxmoor Hall, she didn't receive a rapturous welcome as she had hoped. Instead, the staff were curt towards her, treating her brusquely, like an unwelcome guest, with an abruptly offhandish approach. Josie confided in Tobias that his staff had been most discourteous towards her. As a result, Tobias promptly laid off a couple that had caused his wife offence, which only served to set the cat among the pigeons and made the remainder of the staff very disgruntled. And rather than warming towards Josie, they nursed a contemptuous resentment towards her, for they felt affronted that she may choose to dispose of them if given the fancy. Soon after Josie settled into married life, the new stranger in town had certainly set tongues wagging. The townsfolk were always suspiciously mistrustful of any outsiders, and this pretty unassuming dark-haired young filly had not won over the affections of them greatly, but served only to ruffle their feathers. People in town muttered and gossiped meanly among themselves. Have you seen the young woman that Tobias has married? She's young enough to be his daughter twice over. There's something not right about her marrying a man so old. The rumours seem to grow roots, as behind closed doors and on street corners, and on the backs of carriages, people spoke unkindly about Tobias's new bride. Josie spent much of her time sewing little dolls to give as gifts to the local orphanage in the area, but soon after she blessed the orphans with her dolls. Two of the children died within days of each other from dysentery. Of course, the people in town did not believe for a moment that the orphans' deaths were natural, even though dysentery was rife back then. They immediately linked the sudden deaths of the two young orphans to Josie. She's a witch! I'm telling you, she's a witch! they cried out. She cast a spell on two of those children, and now they're dead! Those dolls she made them were afflicted with an evil hex. She cast a spell on them. Worse still, one of the staff at Foxmoor Hall, who had grievances against Josie, who had threatened to let her go because of her insolent behaviour towards her. So in revenge, she whipped up rumours among the townsfolk. I've seen her myself, she lied, with her witch's cauldron, mixing up all manner of spells. Maybe she'll put a hex on our children next, and then they'll go exactly the same way as those orphans did. It would seem that the atrociously unkind rumours were the very kindling that was needed to spark the fire of the town's fury. One day the townsfolk marched indignantly towards Foxmoor Hall, determined to put an end to Josie Macklington. Some marched on foot to the house. Others rode on horseback as they stormed to the front door, banging it loudly. <coughs> Tobias Macklington opened the door to be met by hundreds of protesting people, screaming, We've come to get the witch! The evil, evil witch! We've come to get the witch! Tobias was bemused. What are you talking about? My wife is not a witch. The idea is ludicrous. I've known my wife all her life from when she was a little girl. She does not dabble in such arts. She's an honourable woman of noble character, just like my first wife Sadie was, who so tragically lost her life in childbirth, along with my baby who was strangled by the cord. In the beginning you didn't warm to her, did you? Then she won over your affections with her good heart. Josie is like my Stacy was. You need to give the woman a chance. She's a woman devoted to our good lord. 
It is with great regret that the people did not listen to Tobias Macklington. Their fury was insatiable, unquenchable. They wanted blood and would not be satisfied until they got it. Kill the witch, some people cried. Burn her, drown her, she must die. The townsfolk were indignant, inebriated by their own bloodlust, incapable of listening to reason or common sense. They did not consider a trial of any kind, no, not at all. They were insistent on dealing with this problem hands on. Josie was a problem that needed immediate extermination, for they would not rest until she'd been dealt with in the manner of which she deserved. You're all grasping at straws, said Tobias. My wife made some doughs for the orphans out of the goodness of her heart. The orphanage was thrilled by her great generous kindness. Two of those orphans died of dysentery. My wife had nothing to do with their fortuitous deaths. Surely you can see that. She cast spells on those dolls. We cannot allow her to harm our children. Furthermore, one of your own staff has seen her concocting all manner of spells with her very own eyes. Whoever this member of staff is, said Tobias, I'm appalled by his treachery. My wife is no witch. I will deal with this gossip monger at once, for no liar can remain under my roof. My wife is innocent of all your ruthlessly cruel insinuations, which have no merit or bearing on the truth whatsoever. Tobias didn't stand a chance. Even his own staff were on the town side. And so two burly men pushed past Mr. Macklington in the hallway and presumptuously trotted into the parlour, where Josie was cowering in terror, knowing without doubt that her end had surely come, for the fury of the townsfolk was like an unbridled fire that could not be tamed or put out. Kicking and screaming, they dragged poor Josie out of the house, throwing a large sack over her head. One powerful man flung her on his shoulders. Kill the witch! Kill the witch! Kill the witch! Kill the witch! The townsfolk were crying out. Kill the witch! Please! 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 Listen to me! Josie called out. Oh, I, I've done nothing wrong! Tears spilled down her cheeks. I had nothing to do with those two orphans dying. You've got to believe me. I'd never willingly harm a child. I'm a woman of God. I'm no witch. One woman in the crowd shouted out, Throw her into the well, so she'll drown. And that is exactly what they did. The townsfolk marched over to the well. In fact, Tobias had two wells at the time, and Josie was flung into one of them. At first they heard cries and screams, and then everything went very, very still. And that was the end of Josie Macklington, as we knew her. And that's a true story, I asked my uncle incredulously. Poor, poor Josie. It's a very sad story, agreed my uncle. But remember, in those days, we're not just talking about Europe or Great Britain. We're talking about America here. And thousands of people were put to death for being suspected of being witches. They were very superstitious in those days. And for the locals, a witch needed to be exterminated, much like a rat infestation. That's how they saw it back then. But Josie, she was innocent. There was no fair trial for her. To plead her innocence was there. It was morally wrong. It was corrupt. Those town folk were warped in their thinking. People often took the law into their own hands in those bygone days. But even if there had been a trial, so to speak, it may not necessarily have ended up in Josie's favour. Even the judge might have been biased. You've heard the whales in the well, haven't you, Dad? Tell Nim all about them. My uncle shrugged his shoulders. Is it wise to scare our guest? We'd like Nim to be able to sleep comfortably at night, would we not? It's all right. I'm really interested in Josie's story. Please tell me what happened. All eyes were on my uncle. 
Do you mind if I smoke? He asked me. Of course not, I said. I'm not actually a smoker, he confessed. But occasionally I have a cigarette to be social. But I certainly need one now. Talking about poor Josie Macklington. Somehow her story shakes me to the core it does. It was such an unfortunate story. All associated here with Foxmoor. I watched my uncle light up his cigarette. He blew out a puff and sighed appreciatively. Ah, that's so much better. Now let's see where to begin. When I was a boy living here at Foxmoor Hall with my parents, my father saw Josie's ghost in the woodgrove. He chased after her, thinking she was a frightened young woman who needed his help. He described her as being as real as you and me, but he said she stopped, looked directly at him, her eyes full of dreadful sorrow, and then she disappeared in front of him. He realised she was wearing an 1800s grey gown with material covered buttons down the central panel, long sleeves, a small waist and a very full skirt. The clothes she was wearing were soaking wet, her hair completely drenched, and there were muddy scuff marks on her porcelain skin. She stopped, looked at him and said, I'm innocent, really I'm innocent, why won't anybody believe me? He had quite the shock, as he realised the woman he had seen was the very same woman in the portrait gallery of Josie in our hall that was commissioned by her husband after she became the lady of Foxmoor Hall. He claimed he saw her ghost running through the woodgrove on a few occasions, not just once, I have to tell you. More recently, possibly about seven years ago or so, I'd been taking an evening stroll on the property myself. You see, I wanted to get to the bottom of some of the strange light anomalies that I'd see in the woods from time to time. And that was when I heard a haunting wailing sound. I realised it was coming from the well. It was a woman's frightened screams. I knew at once it was the ghost of Josie. It couldn't have been anything else. It left me feeling quite rattled. Tell them about the time when you closed the well, my cousin piped. One day, when I took it upon myself to close the well, there was no point having it open. What if our cat fell down there or something? So I boarded up the well, and that night we heard something thundering around the roof, banging the eaves of the house. It scared us half to death. Whatever it was, was extremely angry. We caught sight of this massive, ambiguous black figure. What it was, I do not know. But we knew it was responsible for the noises we were hearing. And whatever it was, it was furiously enraged with us. And I learnt later that it was because we covered the well up. I was terrified, said Ruth, her eyes growing round. You knew something was out there. It was so frightening. But finally the banging stopped. But we did see a strange face peering at us through the window, with a yellow eye shine. We heard some strange grunting sounds, but then the noises stopped. The next morning we went back to the well, and all the boarding had been yanked off. It had been broken into hundreds of tiny pieces, and was lying scattered all around the clearing. Some of the trees in the woodgrove had been furiously bent back. You got the distinct impression that someone was very aggrieved with us. I thought it might be the ghost of Josie, possibly toying with us because we were playing with the well that she had been thrown into all those years ago. It was very peculiar, agreed my uncle. I mean, to just yank those boards off the well like that was incredulous. I mean, who has strength like that? I decided from then on I would leave the well alone. Some things are best not tampered with. I had an ominous sense of foreboding that if I messed around with that well... I would almost certainly be inviting trouble. So something didn't want the well covered up. Do you think it was, Josie? I do, said my uncle. She was trapped in that well, drowned in there. I imagine if I boarded it up, she'd feel there was no way out. Maybe her spirit would leave the well at night to go exploring in the woods. Which might explain why my grandfather noticed Josie's ghostly form was soaking wet at the time. 
She had emerged from the well, I suspect. When my cousin showed me the portrait of Josie, hanging in the picture gallery in the great hall, I did a double take. I looked so like her in every regard, and even my cousin said as much. The similarity in our facial features made me feel oddly drawn to the woman. Even in the picture she looked quite sad. I imagine it must have been tough for her moving away from her loving home, into her husband's home, only to be met by all manner of prejudice and abuse. Even if Tobias, her husband, had been incredibly good to her, he'd been unable to protect her from the vengeful wrath of the townsfolk, who were determined to kill what they believed was a witch. "'She looks so like you, doesn't she?' laughed Ruth. "'It's uncanny, really. My bet is if you wore her dress and had your hair pulled back away from your face like that, you could almost be her double.' In the week that followed, I couldn't get Josie out of my mind the witch, the well, and the story about her life. I was intrigued. Much like my uncle, my cousins had promptly informed me that they too had seen strange light anomalies coming from the woods, and they were scared to go out there at night for fear of what the darkness might actually hold for them. Don't you want to see if we can see the ghost of Josie, like your grandfather did? I asked, surprised, at my cousin's reticent reluctance to go exploring and their obvious lack of curiosity, which for me was most odd. I was a city girl, and far less afraid than they were of the dark. Maybe I was naive, but honestly for two kids that had grown up in the countryside, I clandestinely thought my cousins were rather cowardly. "'Why would you want to see Josie's ghost?' asked Tom. "'Do you want to be frightened out of your wits or something? I know I don't. Going out in the woods at night is a hell of a scary... "'Believe me, you don't want to do it, if you know what's good for you, that is. "'You shouldn't mess around with something you don't understand. "'I've been in those woods at night. I know what I'm talking about. "'The woods change at night. They can be foreboding and ominous, taking on a life of their own.' "'My brother's absolutely right,' said Ruth earnestly. "'You need to listen to him, Nim. We know exactly what we're talking about. "'Over the years we've seen things in that woodgrove.' "'Things we can't possibly explain. "'We've heard peculiar sounds, strange screams coming from those trees. "'If you don't mind my saying, I grew up in a city, and I'm not scared of the dark. "'But you two, who should be a lot braver than me, are being so reluctantly cautious. "'That's what you expect from a city dweller, not two country folk like yourselves.' "'That's low coming from you,' said Tom, looking at me furiously. "'Are you trying to say I'm a wuss?' "'You said it!' came my flippant response. Tom's face grew red. There was one thing he didn't like, and that was being labelled a wuss. "'What do you really want with Josie's ghost?' he asked me again. "'You do realise you probably won't even see her. Ghosts don't just appear at random when you want them to. It doesn't work like that.' "'If I saw Josie, I'd like to tell her I believe she's innocent. "'If she's wandering around the Woodgrove, she probably doesn't know she's even dead. "'It's so tragic. "'I think we should reach out to her, go to the well in the middle of the night, "'see if she comes out. "'Then we can talk to her. "'Psychics do it all the time, you know. "'I've seen it on television programmes. "'There's no reason we can't do exactly the same. "'It would be good to help her if we can. "'She's clearly lost.' "'Are you kidding me?' said Tom, giving me a funny look. "'She's dead. You can't talk to her.' "'You heard what your father said. "'He insisted your grandfather said that Josie told him she was innocent. "'He should have told her that he knew she was. "'Maybe she's been hanging around because she wants someone to believe she's not a witch, "'and then maybe she can finally rest. "'Don't you get what I'm trying to say?' "'All right.' said Nick. We'll come into the Woodgrove with you tonight, but I can't promise you that things will pan out in the way you hope. We probably won't get to see her. Speak for yourself, said Ruth indignantly. Wild horses would not drag me into the Woodgrove at night. I'm sorry, but there's no way I'm coming with you. I can't believe you, Tom. Why are you giving in to Nim's whims like this? You're upset because she called you a wuss. That's what this is about, isn't it? It's not that. I just know that if I don't go into the Woodgrove with Nim, she'll probably go out there all on her own. And we can't have that, can we? It's not safe for Nim to go wandering around. I need to make sure she's safe. You wouldn't, would you? 
Go into the wood grave on your own, asked Ruth, her face growing ashen. If Tom doesn't want me to accompany him in the wood grave, then yes, I will go in there all on my own, I said defiantly. Ruth shrugged her shoulders. I think I should tell Mum and Dad what you're both up to, for your own good. It's not safe for you to be wandering around in the grove at night. It's utter madness, complete lunacy. Sis, said Tom, growing angry. You keep Mum and Dad out of this, will you? Fair enough, said Ruth. But don't you dare come running back to me if you're scared out of your scowls, for I will have no pity on you. Do you understand that? It was at twelve o'clock that night that I was awoken to Tom shaking me. I looked up through half-closed eyelids that were laden down with the heaviness of sleep to see Ruth was standing by his side. They were both wearing jeans, sweatshirts and puffer coats. But I thought you weren't coming, Ruth, I asked her. Ruth crinkled her face in a disgruntled expression. Do I look like I want to come out on this crazy nightly soiree? Absolutely not. But I can't possibly let you guys go out there on your own. I'd be worrying myself sick back in my own bed. So I have to come with you. Now get dressed quickly, Nim, and be quick about it before I change my mind. It's still nippy out there tonight. You're going to need your sports jacket or something like that. A parker, perhaps. You must be quiet. If Dad gets wind of what we're doing, he'll blow a fuse. And I promise you, I'm not joking. You don't want to see Dad when he loses his temper. I hurriedly climbed out of bed, feeling some vague stirrings of excitement. I was secretly thrilled my cousins were coming with me on this mission, as underneath my cocky confidence was a whisper of uncertainty, a nudging doubt, a flapping flurry of flusters in my gut, as if hundreds of pigeons were shaking out their feathers inside of my stomach. It was a feeling that swung from a pendulum of yes and no's, as if a large part of me was reluctantly hesitant about leaving the house and another part of me as eager as a boisterous dog that was gagging for a walk. Before long, we were all tiptoeing down the long sweeping staircase to the lower floor. Ruth kept giving me dagger-like looks when my sneakers began to squeak. I couldn't help it. They were making such an annoying noise. The family dogs who slept in the kitchen began to bark, and for a moment I thought we were in trouble. The dogs had definitely heard us. They bark often, my cousin explained to me. We've learnt to sleep through their barks. If they hear a raccoon rustling around near the bins, they go ballistic, so we're used to it by now. I doubt they wake Mum and Dad up. We hurriedly put head torches on our heads, while I carried my thin powerful torch I'd brought along with me, that I charge in a wall socket. It gives an efficient light source for five hours. My mother bought it from me from a camping shop. Before long, my cousin pulled back the chain from the front door, and finally pushed it open. It made a loud, protesting squeak. Thankfully, the house did not have any alarm system or security that we needed to navigate our way around. The two dogs my uncle owned were ample security and were still barking enthusiastically. I wish to God they'd shut up. If they carry on this way, surely my uncle and aunt would realise something was up. And I didn't want to be responsible for getting my cousins into trouble. Then there we were, out in the gloomy, desolate darkness where the icy arctic fingers of a cold breeze blasted against our faces, searing us with its burning cold touch. We had left the cosy comfort of the house behind us. The twilight was wrapped in the clouds of obscurity, like the stuff you pack in bubble wrap when you move home that you cannot clearly see. It was almost as if black crayon had been scribbled over the landscape, so that the lofty trees and farm buildings seemed hidden behind this tenebrific veil. And even the ethereal moon tonight had clandestinely concealed her glorious golden disk amidst the murky cloud cover, so that her silvery shafts of light had been ruthlessly confiscated, and it seemed as if the stars had joined her in this rebellious truancy. I was glad we were warmly dressed, and that the light on our heads was sufficient to see the path ahead, but I will admit my cocky confidence about not being afraid of the dark was definitely subdued. I knew anything could be hiding in there, and it felt as if from every angle of the woodgrove that there were eyes upon us, and this left me feeling a little discomposed. Are you still sure you want to do this? My cousin Ruth asked me. I nodded my head defiantly, but I wasn't really sure that I did. My former confidence had ebbed away, 
but I was determined to show my cousins that I was no wuss. This city slicker had conviction, and if I said I was going to do something, I would go through with it. I had inherited my father's obstinacy. Before long, we were very cautiously ambling through the wood grove, our sneakers crunching the forest debris beneath our rubber soles, so you could hear the ground crackle, snap and pop, like a bowl of Rice Krispies being munched between very spirited jaws. Sometimes when we brushed against forest shrubs, branches and ferns, it could make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up on edge, as if somebody was touching you. A couple of times I could hear Ruth whispering, What the hell is that? Relax, Ruth, came Tom's reassuring voice. You brushed against a branch, that's all. I wish to God you weren't making us do this, Nim, said Ruth, growling. The lofty trees in the woodgrove whispered among themselves. Branches twisted, jiggled and thrashed, while dark, ambiguous shadows hauntingly seemed to dance through the trees. But the bodeful, uneasy feeling that we were being watched persisted, and its impressions were most insistent. But I told myself that my imagination was being highly suggestive. Soon we'd reached the well, in the open clearing, and then we walked towards it, but there were no sounds that came from the well, no cries of a woman in distress. So what do you want to do now? asked my cousin. I told you I'm going to speak to Josie at the well. I moved towards the well, my cousins following close behind me. I fondly stroked the stone wall, staring down into its hollow depths, and then I called out to Josie. I don't mind admitting I did feel rather foolish, but I came here to find her, and this was the only way to get her attention. I don't know if you can hear me, Josie, but I want you to know we believe you. We know you were not responsible for causing those two orphans to die in the late 1700s. You were so kind to make them those lovely dolls. It was unfortunate that the people here at Foxmoor Hall blamed you for the children's death and all the townsfolk. We know you're not a witch. You were never a witch. You're a good woman, Josie. This is silly, said Ruth. Really silly. Do you really believe she can hear us? I hope so, I said. Let's go and sit over there under the oak tree. See if she comes out of the well. You know what I think about this, said Ruth. I think it's incredibly unlikely that that is ever going to happen. As I keep telling you, this is insane. It's so silly. Shh, I said. Come and sit down under the tree. For a long while, we waited and waited and nothing happened. I could see a smug, self-satisfied look developing on Ruth's face. I actually believed she was gloating. I knew when we got back to the farmhouse, I'd never live this down. Tom's expression was a little kinder, but you could see the scathing doubt on his face, that I could read as clearly as a book. He thought it was incredibly unlikely that anything would happen. And secretly, I believed he was actually right. And that was when we saw it. A dark figure emerged from the depths of the well, pulling herself over the stone edges and climbing out of it. It was the figure of a woman. It was Josie. I knew it had to be her. We were seeing her ghost. I could hardly believe it. My heart was bumping against my ribs like a bedboard slamming against a wall. And that was when the ghost of Josie floated towards us, as if she was walking on air. I wasn't scared, although both my cousins were in a state of abject disbelief. I think in normal circumstances they would have run away in terror, but they were anchored to the spot. I, on the other hand, had almost expected to see Josie. I'm not sure even why. As before coming to Foxmoor Hall, I had not believed in ghosts, but an inner knowing had convinced me that I would almost certainly encounter the ghost of Josie. We could see her bask in the light of our torches. She looked as real as you or me, but we knew she was like a hologram. She was wearing a long 1800s grey gown, as our grandfather had described. She was sopping wet, her tangled hair hanging in sorry limp rags around her face, her eyes almost puffy from tears, her dress soaked with water. "'You believe I'm innocent?' she said to us. "'I believe you're innocent, Josie. Everyone in Foxmoor Hall knows you're not guilty,' I told her. We could see a relief wash over her. 
She smiled warmly at us. You're free to go to the light, Josie, I said. You don't have to stay here any more to prove your innocence. We know you're not a witch. I'm free, aren't I? She said. I'm finally free. She smiled at us and we watched her disappearing into the woods and then she was gone. Oh my God, we saw her ghost, gasped Tom. We saw her ghost. I can't believe it, said Tom. We actually saw Josie's ghost. You were absolutely right, Nim. We should never have doubted you. She needed to hear from us, didn't she? That we believed in her. She needed someone to validate her innocence. All of a sudden, a tall, dark, ambiguous figure came gliding towards us, swinging its arms backwards and forwards. And then, to our utter confoundment, he stood before us, only a foot away. We found ourselves staring up at a big foot. We could hardly believe it. The night was certainly purging up all manner of surprises for us, but I had never banked on encountering a Bigfoot. I do not know why we were not seized with terror, for indeed we should have been, for this lofty, tall, magnificent creature was impressive in every regard, with a noble-looking human face and a ponderous body that was easily as robust and powerful as any farming tractor, but it was not fear that gripped our hearts or seized our bodies with a paralysing fear, for this dignified, distinguished, extraordinary creature's eyes were filled with such a benevolent warmth, such a graceful poise, offering us an assurance that he meant us no harm. Indeed, those treacle-coloured eyes gave off a yellow eyeshine, but they were the kindest, most convivial eyes I have ever beheld. The creature himself had the energy of an angel. It was when he spoke to us in an ancient indigenous dialect that I was rendered completely speechless, especially when his virtuous upstanding words were translated so precisely into my head, so that I understood every word that he spoke so eloquently. I am here to thank you for what you have done tonight. You have sent the lost soul into the light. I was hoping you would come he said to me. We have been calling you for a long time. The young woman has been wandering aimlessly around this wood grove for years and years and years. But today, today of all days, or tonight, should I say, you have led her to the light. Her husband and her father were there to greet there. Imatila nakosha hilatwanisti himotali katolona Imatila dilagoja Ivana Tswakanatalana Homona Kila Sonofo. I saw the reunion myself. I can see into the world of spirits, you see. You can now tell your father that should he wish to board up the well, he has my blessing to do so. While she was still in there, I was not happy for it to be boarded up. Were you the one that banged on our house, ripping the covers off the well? asked Ruth in astonishment. That was me, said the Bigfoot. I'm sorry to have scared you, but blocking the well would have been most unfortunate for a lost soul. Now, if you forgive me, I must be making tracks. But once again, thank you for what you did tonight. I am profoundly grateful. I've been trying to help that poor lost soul cross over for a long time and lead her to the light, but she never seemed to see it until tonight. You were the one that showed her the light. Your words helped the chains of her incarceration finally loosen their hold on her. You told her you believed she was not a witch. She had been waiting for those words for so long. She needed to hear them from someone like you. The Bigfoot nodded at us. May the good Lord be with you, he said. And then he glided into the woods, and me and my cousins hugged each other joyfully. The forest became peaceful. The trees seemed to be jiggling in a joyful dance. The moon suddenly broke through the clouds. The stars shone brightly. And suddenly the trills of the crickets and the frogs could be heard throughout the valley, as if they too were celebrating this freedom of a once trapped soul that had been exonerated from her label of being called a witch so falsely. Josie was now finally free. Suffice to say... I have not forgotten that miraculous night, nor will I ever.
when my paradigm of the world was completely shifted. But I soon became a believer in the miraculous. For when I returned home to my parents, I barely recognised them. Their former contemptuous disregard for each other had melted away, for they were like two giggling lovebirds that couldn't get enough of each other. I have no idea what happened to them on that marriage retreat in France. But at night, I was not awoken to the sound of my parents shouting and saying, Shush, keep quiet, but more to the noise of a headboard banging against the walls and the naughty giggles of both my parents in the throes of passion. I would smile to myself happily in that knowledge that all was well in the world, and even a broken marriage can regain its former joyful vigour. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time. Goodbye and good night.